Um, yeah. Let's see if I can do the video without it clipping out on me. Okay, so um, today, uh, chapter five, and as luck would have it, it's an introduction to surveying. Um, and um, everybody in this class is also in the surveying class. So if I remember correctly, I'm not sure about Vanessa now, but I think so. She hadn't been there in a while. Yeah, but I think she's there. She is. So um, this goes into a little more detail about the different uh, kinds of surveys and stuff that uh, we can uh, expect to, or be familiar with anyway that we should be. So um, it does start with um, the, the measurement of the earth, how we get around the earth. Um, so I think we've already, well, we didn't do that that much in the surveying class, so we could talk about the uh, latitude and longitude uh, ideas uh, behind uh, latitude and longitude and how to, you know, locate something on the Earth. Now, the Earth's being treated, you know, sort of spherical, actually ellipsoidal, um, so that it's easier to mathematically, you know, calculate distances and things like that on the Earth. So how um well let, let's take a look at google earth here let me share that screen quick okay so let me change my options to degrees minutes and seconds so i'm going to show latitude and longitude by degrees, minutes, and seconds. So if you look around the world, we have the prime meridian and, well, the equator as our, oh, there's the equator. <laughs> it's further down, you think. Um, those, those are our reference lines for measuring angles off of the, um, you know, any place on the earth can be referenced by its angular change from the prime meridian and the equator, basically. Does that make sense? So maybe you're already kind of familiar with that, but the uh, lines, uh, the grid lines are called lines of longitude and lines of latitude, right? So lines of longitude run from pole to pole, lines of latitude uh, lay flat, so latitude, flat. Anyway, they're parallel to the equator, and sometimes you'll hear um, them consider, they're called parallels. You'll see that in various uh, places. Uh, when you watch old war movies and things like that, you'll see some gruff sergeant yelling out uh, different parallels or whatever, 33rd parallel, you know, something crazy like that. So those are all the lines of latitude, basically. So uh, let's look at, so what angle are we talking about? What, what's an angle anyway, right? So if you draw a line from, let's say the prime meridian and the equator from that intersection to the center of the earth, somewhere down into the center of the earth, and then back out to some location like where we are, let's see. So we're kind of right around here. There's where old survey marks are. Um, then um, I'm just gonna put my cursor over there and at the bottom of the screen, I can see in Google Earth that it says 36 degrees, 50 minutes. That little tick mark means minutes, 47.02 seconds north. That is my latitude because latitude measures even though, well, those lines of latitude measure how far north or south of the equator you are. So we, uh, sitting somewhere in Farmington, are very near 36 degrees, 50 minutes-ish. And as far as east-west-ness goes, we have um, – well, let me put my cursor back where it goes. Uh, approximately 108 degrees, um, 19 minutes, almost 20 minutes west. 
So we're west of that prime meridian by 108 degrees. So if I followed this line, if I went due north until I hit the North Pole, and then totally flatten that out, and made that angle, so you can see the angles here. So that line, that is our prime meridian, and then the anti-meridian goes on the other side. So 180 degrees around, that straight line you see, those angles at the center of the Earth, basically 108 degrees to the west, puts us right over Farmington. And then 36 whatever degrees north of the equator, again, um, same, same type of thing. If I look at the equator, and then look at the angle it makes with the prime meridian to where we are, Zoom back out. So this angle up here that it makes with this line, the equator line, and, um, and the prime meridian, well, not the prime meridian, but to the center of the Earth, uh, due north. Um, so if I drop due south to the equator, and I draw a line to the very center of the Earth, back out to the where Farmington, that would be a 36 degree angle. So if I could turn that to make the Earth hollow, that angle would come to the center, come to the center, and that would be a 36 degree angle. That's a little harder to show than than the other one because these lines of longitude all converge at the center and so you can see the angle, whereas the parallels, you gotta just kind of see it um, as you see in the book. We okay with that? Yeah. Um, any questions? No. Not yet? Okay. Well, um, Let's look at how to, um, so, since we're dealing with angles a lot, um, even, even in surveying, we use degrees, minutes, and seconds for showing stuff on the map, and the equipment does too. Uh, a total station, optical equipment, it shows you your angle that you turn. So there's angles all over the place, not just you know over the whole earth or whatever. So we have to get kind of, uh, get a, grasp of, of what those angles mean. Okay, so here's Farmington. Here's our campus. Have those layers. Have all these turning points from the survey class on. Okay, so uh, let me just go to the properties of one of these points. And I can see its latitude and its longitude here, right? Well, let's use that, and I don't know if you can see that window. It depends on how, can everybody see the this window here? Yeah. The properties, okay. So the way that these angles are shown are, like I said, is in degrees, minutes, and seconds. And so to be able to uh, switch between them, um, Google Earth does this okay. So if we close that and go to options and change that to decimal degrees, right? This makes it computationally a whole lot easier to look at. Well, not, not to look at necessarily, but I can see the, the angle in, in decimal form, right? So it's very useful to be able to do that um, in your mapping. When we, make a, when we make a map, maybe we have everything in decimal degrees and we need to display them in degrees, minutes, and seconds and such. So um, an easy way to do that is use Excel and, and um, we'll, this will help us to just kind of understand uh, the relationship between degrees, minutes, and seconds and decimal degrees, hopefully. So I'll use this as an example and I'm gonna start up Excel. And maybe I'll have to switch screens here so let me stop sharing. And maybe I'll share just the screen. Okay, 
Is everybody see Excel now here? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna start a blank workbook. I'll zoom in on that a bit. Okay, so um, let's take our decimal degrees here, uh, and so I'm gonna switch between Google Earth in there. So I'm gonna copy this number. and paste it here. I don't necessarily need the symbol there because I won't see it as a number if I do. Okay, so I have this number uh, copied. So that's our latitude at a certain point around campus. And um, I wanna be able to break that down into degrees, minutes, and seconds. And I'll just move this down one. So this would be decimal degrees, right, DD. Then I want it to be decimal uh, degrees, minutes, and seconds. Okay. Well, um, I already know the degrees, right? The whole number of degrees is 36. I can, I can just see it. Well, how do you make Excel do that, right? Can, can Excel like just give you the whole number of a decimal? Can it just give you... Now you might think of rounding, but that would that would round up to 37, right? So there is a function called the truncate, so trunk. So that truncates a number to an integer by removing the decimal or fractional part of the number. So that's great. So I put in parentheses this A2, cell A2, right? And then I get the 36. Is that okay? All right. Take that as a yes. How about the minutes? I don't see the minutes there, although I, I do see like the rest of this, the 0 0.770657. Well, that, that's a fractional part of the whole degree, right? So that's less than a degree, which should be in some sort of minutes. So how would you get the minutes out of this number? Would you divide that by 60 or times it by 60? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I would take that fractional. So this is basically 0.770657. Uh, degrees, right? So how many minutes is that? I mean, 36 degrees is 36 times 60 minutes. So yes, exactly. So how do I get that 0.77 number out of there? There's actually another function that you could do. Uh, there's two ways to do this, right? I could take it, I could just take this number and subtract the degrees, right? So there's the 0.7, right? That's just that's just taking 36.77 blah 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 minus 36 and I'll be left with the uh, 0.77 blah 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 right um, slightly less annoying I guess is the modulus right modulus or modulo is takes a number so let's let's just use an example here um, Let's take uh, four divided by three, right? So four and the divisor being three. So what is the uh, modulus of that? Well, it should be just the remainder. Um, why is that one? So the number and the divisor. So I take four and I divide it by three. Let's see, maybe I need to do four thirds and my divisor is one. There we go. Huh. That should just take the divisor. Anyway, 
going to do the same thing with my 36.77 with a divisor of one, right? So I'm just going to use a two, that number divided by one and leave me the remainder, basically the what's left over. And so I get my 0 0.7706057. And um, to get that right, I would multiply that by 60. And so there's, uh, well, okay, that's a decimal minute, right? But I want seconds out of that, so I do want that number there, but I don't want the 0 0.239 stuff, right? So what if I just truncate the whole thing? Trunk, and go to the end, and the parentheses. So I'm going to take that modulus of A2 and 1, multiply it by 60, and truncate it. And so there's that 46. Is that okay? So the truncate cuts off the remainder. The modulus just leaves the remainder. <laughs> um, so that combination allows me to see the whole minutes, right? So I, I truncate the whole decimal degrees. Um, not truncate, but I, I take the modulus of the whole degrees there, and that takes away the whole degrees, and I'm left with the 0 0.77 stuff. I multiply it by 60, and I'm left with another, you know, 46 point something, something, something. And I truncate that 46 point something, 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 and I'm left with 46. That, is that okay? Okay. Yes. Okay. Let's get that in a little. So the so okay. Now if I just copy this, right? If I just get this, okay, I'm gonna copy that number and hit escape to get out of that cell and uh, equals and then paste that. Right? So if I do the exact same thing, I'll be left with uh, these decimal minutes, right? But instead of truncating it like I did in the minutes, what if I just take the modulus of it to get the point, the point two three nine four two? It's getting kind of complicated, right? So if I just take that and get the modulus of it, so I'm going to do the mod of the mod, right? So I take the mod of all this. And divided by one, I need another set of parentheses here. Or do I? Yeah, I kind of do. There we go. So the modulus of A2, which is my decimal degrees, uh, leaves me with the 0 0.77061. Multiply by 60, I get 46.23. And so this whole number right here highlighted is 46 point whatever. And I take the modulus of that and I'm left with the whatever part, right? There's my point two four. So 46.23942. But that's just decimal minutes at this point, which I can multiply by 60 to get, well, decimal seconds. And then I'm done, right? So see how with seconds, I multiply it by 60 twice. So to get, so one second is 3,600, uh, well, one degree is 3,600 seconds. So, so there we go. Did that. And then you could round that or whatever to whatever it needs. So I'm going to flip back to Google Earth. So we're going to check that with, um, let me cancel, that was TP5 here. I'm going to change my settings back to degrees, minutes, and seconds. Go back to TP5 and properties. So there we go, 36, 46, 14.37. There we go. Is that right?
What was the formula on that one for 14.3? Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. So, you know, the formula, that's just how Excel, you know, does that. But, but basically, we could do this with a regular calculator too, huh? So I'm going to take this number. I think I already have it. No, I don't have a cap. So um, I'm going to copy it. Okay, escape. Um, let's go to a calculator. So I'm going to take 36.770657. Okay, so I would record, I would write down the 36 part, right? And I would basically subtract 36. And there's my decimal degrees, uh, the remainder. So that's the, that basically that's modulus of A2, right? And so I'm gonna multiply that by 60. And there's my 46.2392. Well, subtract the 46, and that's my decimal minutes. And I multiply that by 60, and I get the 14.3560, Yeah? If I wanted to go the other way, it's actually quite a bit easier, and that's just a straight up conversion and add them together, right? Because I'm, I'm I would take the seconds and convert those to degrees, and take the minutes to convert them to degrees, and take the degrees and just add them, right? So use that in here. Let's go back to let's let's redo it. So I'm going to take. We're going to make that equals. That's going to be 36 plus, well, 46 divided by 60, right? So 46 divided by 60 is going to be, well, real close to 0 0.75, you know, uh, uh, degrees, right? 45 minutes is actually three quarters or 0 0.75 degrees. So 45 minutes is three quarters of an hour, right? So degrees and hours are very similar in that respect. So I'm gonna add the seconds portion of it, right? So there's the seconds divided by 60 again. It's actually not because I'm jumping all the way to degrees, right? So that's actually 3,600. So one second is a, is a 3,600th of, of a full degree. So 14.3652 seconds divided by 3,600, that's how many degrees I'm going to get out of this. So I add all those degrees up, the 36 plus the 46 over 60 plus the 14.3652 over 3,600, and that should give me the, the number I had. There may be rounding error ultimately especially when you're dividing by 60 and stuff there, you know, when you divide by three or six or nine, a lot of times it's a repeating decimal and those get chopped off. And so there's a little bit of, sometimes you get a rounding error going on. But in this case, it's different enough to where dividing by 60 is not gonna matter too much. Is that all right? Okay. Well, top of page 133 shows uh, the magnitude of the size of the earth, basically. And so when, when you survey, right, when you measure distances on the earth, we treat them as flat. Right, so um, 
when like okay let, let's imagine you're looking through a telescope like on a total station or something and you're looking through the lens and you're reading a rod right that line that the light that reflects off that rod and gets back to your eye through that lens is basically a horizontal line but this the earth is not horizontal on the surface right over small distances they are but um over longer distances and well and and that's what this graphic on page 133 or yeah 133 is is telling you is that if you treat a distance a horizontal distance uh as on the earth as straight you're gonna get so if you measure off a mile if you had a scope strong enough to see a mile um and you measured you're gonna be about uh two-thirds of a foot uh off vertically just because of the curvature of the earth and that's that's what we did in the surveying class with the with, there's actually a formula to calculate that so so, so there um, additionally though in this graphic also shows that if you measure a distance on the earth horizontally that actual distance on the surface of the earth is going to be about uh, over 36 miles you're going to be about two-thirds of a foot off so that's far less error than than you um, than vertically right so vertical is is much more error um, basically 36 times the error than horizontally so all right so when we talk about plane surveying uh, we can keep within, you know, um, the boundaries of small construction projects and stuff. Larger construction projects, such as pipelines and bridges and things that are miles across and things, uh, do need to figure those uh, curvature effects. How about that? Okay. So, great. The... We, we, we did talk about this in surveying class also, the different types of surveys that we run across. Um, so um, they're also mentioned in this book, so I'll just reiterate those. Uh, we went over them pretty quickly. I'm gonna do that again. Um, so it talks about control surveys. Control surveys establish points. Uh, they take extreme measures to make sure that the, the locations that are measured are as accurate as, as humanly possible, as, as much as, as accurate equipment as is available is used to establish these, what are called control points. And those points are used for measuring, you know, for, for referencing, you know, uh, a lot of different uh, surveys, you know, other surveys for not just construction projects, but also for, uh, measuring land in general. Okay, so um, a boundary survey or a land survey comes in different flavors also. Um, property surveys or cadastral surveys are also um, deal with like boundaries, uh, political boundaries like, like property or states or counties, cities, those, those types of boundaries are, uh, are all fall into the category of land surveys. Topographic surveys um, are surveys that, that measure, well, elevation mainly, that show the topography of, of something. So, so those are about hydrographic surveys, uh, water features, uh, measuring the boundaries and, and uh, you know, of lakes or rivers to show um, change usually. And, also to establish floodplain combined with topographic survey. Photogrammetric surveys are so surveys used with, with aerial photography or satellite imagery, mostly aerial photography because it's higher resolution. Um, uh, route surveys, again, those are more linear. They can st stretch over miles and miles or even continents, um, laying down uh, power lines or uh, uh, internet, uh, what do you call those, uh, fiber optic lines, uh, other kinds of cabling, 
the route surveys are used to establish where those entities or those the, that type of infrastructure would go. Another kind of survey is an as-built survey. So you're basically measuring something that's already there. There's actually, let's see, if I flip forward just a little bit, they talk about the equipment. There is a laser, um, basically a, a home, not a home, but a ground uh, laser scanner. Yeah, top of page 152 is, um, is the primary tool for as-built types of surveys, but things that are already yeah. built. Yeah. What, what page are you guys on? You know, kind of flipping around, but um, on page 152 is a picture of a laser scanner. We just did a short, yeah, um, a, just a short little exercise about going from decimal degrees. That's my DD column. Okay. And, and, and breaking it up into degrees, minutes, and seconds. So we can go over that again uh, shortly after I kind of talk about some of this other stuff, but yeah. Okay, so um, here's a picture on the top of page 152 of a person uh, manipulating the controls on a uh, laser scanner, right? So you're familiar with what a scanner does, right? It just, just takes reflections, um, like even just a, well, that's, that's what almost all sensors do is just look at reflected light or energy, right? So a laser generates its own uh, energy and, and reads what it gets back, right? And so that's a LIDAR. So that's a light detection, detection and ranging. So that gives distance, right? So a laser just shoots a bunch of pulses at whatever it's aimed at and reads back what it gets. So it's, it's actually kind of a complicated piece of equipment, but um, it does this very fast, thousands of times a second. Uh, computer uh, processors can, can, can manage that kind of uh, bandwidth of, of data. Anyway, um, the next page, on page 153, you see buildings that have been scanned. And so the top, you, you might see what, what's the difference between this. Uh, because these scanners also have a camera on them. And so the pulse is, what do you call it, in tandem with an image, right? So they're, they're um, tagged with an image. So we know that a certain pulse has a certain set of pixels that go with it. And from that, you can build. So the top image is actually the point cloud. And so the points, that's just a bunch of points, like millions of points for this building is probably billions of points. And every point is just colored, right? Just by the pixel that it was, that it was on. And then the lower image is where the image that was attached to each pulse is actually stretched over the the building or those uh, over every point. So from point to point, it actually fills the gap. So whereas the top image, it might look like an image of something, but kind of grainy. Those are just the points. And then the bottom is where the points, the images are attached to the points. And so those images are overlaid and, and stitched together and to be a, what they call geo-referenced and, and uh, draped over that image and stitched together. So uh, that's the technology that, that, that can happen. Um, our um, drones can also do this. Um, so we have land-based scanning, LIDAR, and we have aerial-based scanning and LIDAR. So um, I think we can um, take a look at what that looks like. You know, we see some pictures here, but we can actually manage some of that data ourselves. So um, let me just minimize that, cancel that. Um, so we, we just, uh, so Noah, we just took, um, I think it was TP5, its properties. We got the decimal degrees of this. Actually, okay. if I just go to options here, I just change it to decimal degrees. 
and then I look at the properties of you know one of these turning points, and then I copied and pasted this the, the latitude of so that's how far north it is of the equator. And I took that number and we parsed it back out uh, to degrees, minutes, and seconds. So we'll, we we can reiterate how to do that. Um, we'll do that often anyway, so it's it's good. Okay. okay. So um, I think I can close this. Now I'm going to go to let's let's uh, on online here. There's my video. Yeah, I think it's done processing. No, it's 50% done. 51. Okay. That's for another class, actually. So I'm still kind of low on bandwidth here. Um, actually, I think it's done uploading, so I think I'm okay now. Maybe that's why it's going okay. So um, I'm going to go to different places have different data. So um, let's try rgis.unm.edu. I think you can get LIDAR data out of here. So it's gonna, it's still taking a minute to, up, I think it's done uploading now. Yeah, I'm running out of bandwidth. How's that doing? That should be done. Okay, here we go. Um, yeah, let's just click on the get data. Is everybody here? Um, oh, well, you don't have to be. Although I, I will want you to download a piece of data. If just one person in class does it, then everybody can share it if it's on the server. So that'd be a good way to do it. Anyway, I'm gonna click on get data. And I'm going to look for elevation, really. Um, or I could search for LIDAR. I don't know if that's going to work. Let's see what I get. Yeah, look at that. OK. Um, yeah, that's, that's a great one. Well, I don't even know what that is, actually. So I think it's a grid. So this isn't the raw data. Um, However, that's nice because it has the Farmington Animus. Let's just see what that is. It's an image file. Yeah, all right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and save it. Yeah, it's a zipped file. And yeah, I'm going to put it in my ArcGIS projects folder. How big is it? Yeah, it's less than a gigabyte. <laughs> it's going to take a minute. So um, while that's working, I'll just suck up more bandwidth here. And we'll go to the county. The county also has how about sjcounty.net. It has a GIS page that, let's see, under government. And GIS, where's the GIS? Geographic Info Systems. I think you can download the actual uh, LiDAR data. Let me see if it has it. Hmm. It may be under this WMS service. I don't think so. This is mostly imagery. Yeah, that's imagery. So. Somewhere in here, I don't know if it's under base map. Let's 
see if it has LIDAR. Nope. They used to. In fact, if you need it, if you want it, um, I think you can. You can get it from them. Um, let me see. Sometimes it comes in LAS format. Nope. I guess they don't have it. So we're going to have to rely on either this Argus data or uh, on the national level. They have a they they've collected a lot of data also for um, for download. So. Um, Still working there. Okay, let's go to the Nash. I think it's TNM. Yeah. Well, I guess if you if you just do a search for the national map, um, you'll go to the well, or you could just type in viewer.nationalmap.gov and if you just type that in, viewer.nationalmap, one word, .gov, then it should get you to this page, which may take a minute to load since I'm downloading. At this point, um, we can look for different products on the left. And well, before you, actually search for those products you can zoom in on the on the area that you want the, to get that data for and and that's how you get data out of the national map which is very cool but while we're waiting for that let's just keep doing stuff i want to look at the um metadata let's click on html here and we'll take a look at how they got this data metadata is data about data right so um, yeah, let's, let's look at the abstract. This metadata record describes the bare earth shaded relief for the 2016 Farmington LIDAR project, covering approximately 1,500 square miles in two areas near Farmington, northern New Mexico. The BLM contracted with Sanborn, uh, who flies over with a LIDAR, mapping services for two area of interests in northwestern New Mexico encompassing FFO land. I'm not sure what that is. And surrounding the city of Farmington and portions of the San Juan Basin, blah, blah, blah. So, yep, they're using uh, LIDAR data. I don't know if there's much else. Yeah, uh, UTM zone 13, so that's actually the uh, coordinate system that it uses, so that might be useful to to take um, to be delivered in LAS, which is like an ASCII format of the data. Basically, it's X Y Z points, millions of them, right? So, what what they mean by bare earth also is um, actually they already shaded this, so it's not going to be as cool, but um, it. Shaded relief is, is a method used to shade the hills so you can get the, a picture of the topology um, just by a grayscale map. So um, it's an efficient way to do it, but, but I was looking for the LAS data set, but I don't think we can get that. Okay, let me shut that down. Oh, bare earth. So how do they get that, right? So um, what's great about the light, LIDAR data is it can you know a laser can um you know it's pretty pretty small pulses of basically thousands of, of pulses of of light from a laser um from an airplane shoot to the ground and then the sensor uh, determines how much time it took for the for each pulse so each pulse has its own little signature so as each one little pulse gets back to the sensor it records that how much time it took and so that's the distance the plane is from the ground from that particular point in the ground uh, the plane has a gps system on it and knows the altitude with a barometer and the gps very accurately 
So this data is georeferenced, meaning it knows where that pulse is on the ground, and it knows its elevation because of the plane itself and the time it took for that light to get from the plane back to the plane. So, however, <laughs> uh, when you're flying over trees or vegetation, um, some of the pulses, some of the laser pulses, get all the way to the ground and bounce back up, and some hit a leaf and bounce back up, or the top of a building or something like that. And then, so what that ends up getting is a point cloud of all the first returns, which would be the ones hitting the tops of the trees, and the last returns, which is all the stuff from the bare earth, right? So if you just map out the, the last returns, you can, you can get a, a model of just the bare ground. So that's what they mean by bearer. It's quite ingenious, I guess. Is that right? Um, I don't know how much time it's going to take. I'm at 89 out of 790. <laughs> this may take a minute. A couple minutes more. Okay. Uh, let's see how the national map's doing. Wow. Um, I'm going to pause this. I'm not going to have time to, let's see if I can pause that and then come back to the national map. Maybe it'll show us what, so I want to see if I can get an LAS data set out of this and then we can kind of take a look at it. Other products that LIDAR can get, not just shaded relief types of uh, data, but also digital elevation data in image format, which is much easier to use. Um, so I'm just gonna refresh this. Well, that is almost all I wanted to say about this chapter and give you just a, a small example of doing that. Um, one other thing about um, using data um, more and more survey type of data is in 3D format, right? So even though LIDAR data is inherently 3D, it gives you an X, Y, and a Z, basically. It's, it's location in 3D space of every little point. And then those points combined, you know, can be an as-built survey or just a terrain model, um, things like that. And so uh, the products that derive out of that are what are mostly used. Um, such as like a contour map, right? Well, there's a whole chapter on contours. <laughs> I think it's chapter eight or something. And those are um, um, traditional, I guess I would say, uh, methods of showing, of measuring the earth. Um, but it's so much better than contours like this LIDAR data. Um, and so what the trend is that uh, more and more data is being shared and and produced in its native, well, maybe not native 3D format, but in some sort of 3D format, so that it can be manipulated and measured. And and the other products, you know, the measurements basically are taken directly from this from a 3D model rather than uh, products like like digital elevation models or or contour maps and things like that are derived from that 3D data. So uh, 3D is, being, is, is just increasing in popularity as far as its common use in, in industries such as surveying, as well as many others. Um, so it's, it's an interesting uh, trend that's happening. Okay, well, um, I think I've just tapped out the <laughs> ability of, let's see, I think the my YouTube stuff's done. This is let me refresh that one more time. 
perhaps not. Got my download pause, so I don't know why that's not happening so well. Anyway, the national map also has uh, LIDAR data for various areas. Usually they're uh, areas of interest as that metadata showed in the other data set. So this, you know, that's just too much data really to just cover the earth with, you know, pinpoint accuracy. And, you know, we're talking about accuracies of, of centimeters rather than, you know, a, a regular uh, elevation model would be in 10 meter squares rather than centimeter squares. So it's a huge jump from one step to another. Um, Drones are being used more and more in this respect. Um, however, the technology of putting LIDAR on a drone is, is very new. Um, it's, it's being done um, in, a, in a few instances, but it's very expensive. So um, not, as, not as widespread as using imagery. So the problem with imagery on drones is it's simple. Um, but you, and you can get a 3D model just from the images, but it's also, it can't get you the bare earth or the first returns like the canopy. Well, it can do canopy, I guess, but, but it has limitations as far as thin um, or transparent types of materials, whereas LiDAR doesn't care. It can, it can show reflection, it can show, it, it can get a lot more useful data um, just because of its net properties. Well, um, go back here. National map, usgs.gov. Let's see if I'm on the right one. The national map viewer. Let's see if this can refresh now. There we go. Now this is only a viewer, but perhaps I wanted to make a download from it. So somewhere in here, there's a link. Yeah, maybe it's just, yeah, data download, right? So let's say I'm interested in Wow, that's just very fast. Just the Farmington um, area to somewhere in Farmington. And now I want to download some data, right? So I click on the download data and I'm back to this map. Now it refreshes, so great. <laughs> so this is actually, I'm back to <clears throat> viewer.nationalmap.gov. And now I see some things I can search for. Um, one of which I think if I go, <clears throat> yes, there, so now it has two categories, elevation products, which are derived from LIDAR and other radar um, and other just imagery services. So anyway, if I go to elevation source data, I can, I can pull up, well, a couple things. Um, I'm not exactly sure what this other stuff is. Um, if SAR is a project, I, I suppose. Not sure, or orthified or ortho rectified radar image. Um, LIDAR point cloud is maybe what I wanted to show and show, um, show availability. There we go. So you can see that, wow, you know, over more populated areas, you're going to, you know, the mountains of Kentucky, not so much, but, you know, Iowa, wow, they have a big program apparently. <laughs> Almost that whole state is covered in it. But I think around Farmington we have a bit along the Animus River. So the um, area of interest and then um, looks like what some of the Nappy area. So we have some areas in Farmington where we have um, well it looks like the medium green which um, tells me the 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 accuracy of the of the lidar data. So the lidar point cloud is is from a range of 0.35 meters to 0.7 meters, I believe. 
So um, file format, LAS or LA zipped LAS. And let's just see if we can get some of that. Okay, so I just check that and find products. Let's see if we can download a LiDAR data set. So it's um, another thing, you know, I just click on it or whatever, but, but by default, it uses your zoom level of your map. So I, I was, I was, um, I made sure that it was zoomed in on the area that I was interested in. And with that checked, then it's going to search that area only. And that way the search is faster and it pulls up the data that you want. So um, if I want to see the footprint of these, so I have three hits on the search here. And so I have the uh, point cloud animus, they're all um, 2014 and in grids, right? So if I show the footprint, there's that little guy, there's that little guy, and there's that little guy. Um, not sure why it didn't pull up more. Oh wait, maybe it did. Oh yeah, it did. <laughs> I didn't see that scroll. So let's say, um, let's try to get over, um, the campus here, if I can find it. Pinion Hills, there's Salem College. Okay, yeah, so um, turn off that footprint and that footprint, and I'll just scroll down and just try to find the footprint that, okay, those two will cover the Salmon College um, area, right? And so unfortunately it's in two pieces. Let's just try one at a time here <laughs> for, um, so I'm gonna I'm just download it right now. Um, I'm gonna download the LAS file because I think our ArcMap can deal with it. So let's just download LAS. And yeah, it's gonna go to my projects folder. Good, it's only 100 megabytes. So that's actually a lot. If you typed in, I mean, that's just X, Y, Z values, just row after row after row of X, Y, Z for every point. And it, um, so can you imagine typing in a Word document or something and having it 100 megabytes in size? How many pages do you think that would be? <laughs> so even a long essay is just a couple, couple kilobytes. A few seconds left here. So while the 15 seconds left, I'm going to go ahead and launch ArcGIS. See if we can make sense of this LiDAR data. So I'm going to start a new map. Let's just call this. Civil Chapter 5. Okay, so in my catalog, I'll be ready to pull in this LAS data set. Now I might need some tools. I don't think I can just grab it and throw it into the map, but maybe. There's See where I am with it. Looks like it's done. Yay. So let's go to show in folder. Um, by the way, I'll hold on to that. So, so there it is. I'm going to go ahead and move it. I think the folder's in here anyway. Where's my, there it is. So I'm just going to drag that and drop it in my civil chapter five folder. There you go. And yeah, it's zipped. So I'm going to unzip it here. Ends up being 240. So um, 
yeah, basically this file is yeah, an LAS file. There we go. And there's some metadata that goes along with it. There's an HTML metadata file with it and the zip file and things like that. But um, the GIS should be able to see that okay. So in here, yeah, there's the LAS file. I think it might actually, if I just drop that in there. Yay, comes in as a square. <clears throat> However, um, that's, that's good. So if I look at the um, value here, um, it's shading it already. Um, I think all I need to do is zoom in. And then I can start seeing the points. So these are all green. So that gives me, um, I think I should be able to click on a point and it pulls up some results here. And I can get, hopefully what I'm mainly looking for here is its classification, which in this case is overlap. Um, I'm not even sure what that means. <coughs> um, elevation, that's what I'm looking for. So there I go. Well, that, that's all well and good. I think if I zoom out too far, yeah, I'm gonna lose, yeah, it, it, it's not gonna let me, there. I'm zooming in just a little bit further and I can see the swaths of, of lines that it, it took the LiDAR data from. So in and of itself, it's not all that useful, although I do see some you know, larger, um, higher elevations, if I click on some of those, I get a, maybe a higher elevation of 1800. Yeah, it's closer to the top. Okay, that's nice. But we can produce products out of that. We can generate 3D models from, from this as well. Um, let's try just going to its properties. And The filter, um, I wonder if I can show elevation. Feature as uh, absolute height. Let's just go with, um, let's just do ground, right? So uncheck all and let's just look at the ground elevation and return values, well, with ground, it's, it, it, I think um, I could just do, this is more of a manual way. So these are the returns, right? So the last return would be like the lowest, right? That would take, that's the, the beam that lays our blade, light our pulse that took the longest to get back, right? So it's categorized into 15 other different categories. So that's really great. Anyway, I'm just gonna pick on ground here and anything classified as ground maybe. So yeah, I see fewer of them. Um, I can see a water tank over here that's, that's not considered, not classified as ground. Let's see. Building. So now here's ground and building. Too far. So I should have, I would have, yeah, so I can see some of these points coming out here for the buildings. Um, that's great. Uh, what about, I think under appearance, I might be able to, yeah. Um, first return just gives you the landscape. Um, they're supposed to be. Yeah, so this is why it's clipping it. I have a display limit of 4 million uh, points. So what if I put a 10 in front of that? So same number of points for ground, but let's just do all points and see if I can crash my computer. I think I'm still in, um, well, 
that turned him back on. Um, there are some tools here, uh, classification, automatic reassign. Um, there are some tools in, in here that you can play with or work with. Surface derivatives, let's look at we can generate contours. Let's see if we can. Input surface, output feature class. Um, that's fine. Contour interval. Let's do two feet, or actually one meter. Oh, you get enough one. I think this is in meters, so um, I would have to look in. Let's look at the general source. Spatial reference tells me more. Yeah, vertical units are in meter. And, and that makes sense because when you see 1600 to 1800, that's around 5,500 feet. Okay, so contour interval one foot, base contour zero. That's our mean sea level zero. Uh, let's see. Contour field, uh, contour, I could just do elevation, like, you know, just name it something else, like ELEV or whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, index contour field, um, so this is, this is great. Um, I could convert it, the Z factor converts it to feet if I wanted, let's just see. Environments, let's pick the output coordinate system. Yeah, NAD, uh, UTM zone 13. So I'll just keep that same coordinate system. And let's just run it and see what it does. <laughs> okay, so right on top of that, let me turn this off now. This is a contour map. Basically, all these uh, lines are lines of constant elevation, right? So um, it's quite detailed, um, almost unreadable. Um, other, if I didn't have some labels and things like that, and so uh, you can, we'll get to this one and get to chapter eight actually, but um, it does tell me the elevation and whether it's, I thought it was gonna give me an index. Index interval field didn't give me that. Does this have a table? Oh, yeah, um, let's go back to the map. Um, on this, let me turn the contours off. And um, yeah, under symbology, right? So um, if I go to appearance and symbology, I can look at uh, just the points themselves and I can color code them based on their elevation, right? So each one of these points is a uh, just a pulse from the laser, basically, or a group of pulses. Um, but maybe we can go, uh, we can symbolize the whole thing with contours, whereas um, I don't need to, um, actually create another data set for that. I can, I can set right now the contour intervals at five. So I, I don't have as many here, but there is a contour at five. Let's see about, and, and I can set index ones. So every five, uh, every fifth index or a contour is an index. So what about this one? Use um, edge, draw using simple. So now it's connecting the points with lines. <laughs> um, not 
super useful, but this is what a triangulated irregular network uh, allows you to provide. And I think, I think if you just go to, um, let's do elevation. And I think I can turn off points. Uncheck draw. There we go. And I'm going to uncheck the contours. Now I'm going to uncheck the edges. And then I get this nice ish. Um, this would be called a TIN, uh, triangulated irregular network. So just, just making, I uh, zoomed in pretty far. There we go. So now I can see roads and, and so I can see the terrain. Each of these guys is a, is, so you can see the vegetation around it, right? So that's why a bare earth model uh, works pretty well. So let's just do ground. So now it takes out the vegetation. So all those little bumps were the bushes and pinion and whatever that was going around. So um, that's a nice use of um, LAS or um, just basically XYZ data. In fact, not that I want to beat a dead horse here, but boy, is that still... Am I still trying to download? Oh yeah, I I paused it, so I'm okay. If I go back to my project here, I think I put it in my. There you go. If I try to open this, it's it's an ASCII file, so I suspect. Well, I can't really tell, but if I go to View and Show File Name Extensions. Here, yeah, the LAS file. Let me see if I can open with like a notepad. Um, yeah, it's it's not an ASCII format, so it's not going to show me that. But I can see the X, Y, and Z. You know, the you know separated really by specific. I can see a repetition of characters here, where that might work. So anyway, don't need that. All right, what else can we see? First point returns. Um, so that's the, basically that's the canopy and that includes buildings and such. So if I try to pan over to some buildings over here, um, at this point, I could even export this out as buildings, so I can get like building footprints from it. Um, that is a lot of uh, that is the way a lot of cities um, produce um, building footprints, just by getting those the, the stark differences in elevation for a building, you know, such as eight to ten feet in difference. Okay. Um, it's gonna do something else, I forgot. What time is it? 11.20. Can we take a quick break? Get a drink of water. We okay, any questions though? Oh, um, sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear that. Let me turn this up a bit. Ooh, that might be loud. Okay, go ahead. Uh, where's where's the no, uh, video going to be posted at? The recording of it? Oh, um, yeah. Um, it's going to be kind of long, two hours long. Um, oh, maybe okay. I can clip some of that out. Um, yeah, I'll, I can post it by the end of the week. Okay. Yeah. A All lot right. of times, a lot of times I might want to, because it's, I can I can just reiterate this in a shorter video, so, <laughs> so maybe I'll maybe I'll do that sometime. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, good question. Um, yeah, let's take a quick break, and we'll uh, we'll uh, go on from there.
Yeah. I 
We can talk about the Excuse me. Is the coordinate plane state plane New Mexico? Sorry, I was muted <laughs> to answer your question. Um, yeah, this is the coordinate system that, that this data is in, that is projected to. And that is 
Well, the North American datum of 1983 is based on a, a, about as accurate a, a measurement of the Earth as, as we have, right? Updated in 2011. The, um, here, Google Earth actually shows the, it says 13N as far as its uh, zone here. Yeah, zone 13N. What that means is, let me come back to Google Earth here. Google Earth can show the UTM zones. UTM is Universal Transverse Mercator. So right now I'm seeing lines of latitude and longitude, right? So if we go to options, I can change that to UTM, which are meters based. So now what this is, is lines of longitude are actually just polar lines uh, broken into 60 zones around the Earth. Uh, and so the beginning zone is out here on the anti-meridian and it comes, uh, it, go, it increases east. All 60 zones all around the world back to the prime meridian, right? So we, and, and so if there are 60 zones going all around the earth, um, then they are six degrees apart. So six degrees on the earth is around 600 kilometers, 670 kilometers at the equator and a little bit less as you go north, of course. So as we zoom in, we see that Arizona and Utah are primarily in zone 12. Zone 13 goes through New Mexico on the left end, and that happens to be around the, the 108th degree of latitude, latitude, longitude, sorry, which, which happens to go real close through Aztec and is pretty parallel to the Old Ruins Road, actually. So that's, um, that's nice. So zone 12 and zone 13 change um, in Aztec. So that actually brings up an interesting uh, problem for San Juan County when they do surveying and they do that. They, um, a lot of times they'll measure in zone 12, even if it's in Aztec or sometimes you'll see a lot of Farmington data in zone 13, right? Such as, um, where's the zone number now? Did I go too far? Yeah, there it is, big 12 right there. So this 12, um, really that data should be in zone 12, but it's in 13 because it's so close to, because the county bought it or I don't know what, I don't know why they did that actually. So um, good question. The data here is in zone 13, but it really is in zone 12. A lot of times you'll see it misrepresented and sometimes the data, in fact, I bet if I try to download, yeah, let's download something else. Um, let's go to that Argus site here. And, um, I'll just do a small elevation, um, the DEM. They may have fixed all these by now. And then I'll type in Farmington. So here are two DEMs. These are just, these are fairly small. They're 10 meter pixels and they are in uh, Farmington, right? So let's download one of these. I'll download it as a DEM file, which is no big deal. Should take a minute.
Well, as it turns out, I think I already have it downloaded. So let's just jump over to my catalog and see if I can find it. I'm going to add a folder location here. Go back to maybe my documents or maybe the ArcGIS folder. See if I can find this DM in here. Yeah. So we'll turn off that and turn off these, make things a little bit faster. Okay. Okay, that does line up. So that's Farmington South. And here's Farmington North. It asks if I want to um, build pyramids. And for any imagery, it, it asks this. And it basically is just different resolutions of images. So the same image at different resolutions. So it just takes out pixels, basically. And so when I'm zoomed out like this, it doesn't try to show every single pixel as I go through it. So anyway. Um, here are the digital elevation models that are derived from probably this LIDAR data, or well, not actually, um, 10 meter DEM data is probably satellite based. So if I could make this colored image, right? So um, in the symbology here, I could just change this to a typical elevation. Oh, there's lots of elevation ones. How about that one? That looks a little weird. How about that one? That looks weird too. That look weird. Guess that's about as good as it gets. <laughs> I'll do this one too. Okay, so see the river and all that kind of stuff. So um, lower lying elevations are light blue and they transition to green and then to brown and then to white for the higher elevations. So this would be the south bluff, I guess, and then the river and so forth. You can see the stitch line in between it. So you can actually join these two together if you want and blend them. Um, another way to do this is, let's see, What should I do? Oh, well, that, that's great. Um, you can also produce um, from this data, I think I can export some, a variety of, of different um, products from the, 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 what do you call it, the raw data. Right, so um, from this, maybe I could just do the buildings, right? So let's see what that actually does. So the input features, I'm, I've never done this before. Oh, um, yeah, you would have to have polygon features. You can generate these polygons also from from the um, from the data itself, you can you can make those polygons, but um, those aren't going to be as exact as as maybe using CAD files and things from from the data. So, huh? Yeah, I'm not going to do that. Anyway. Um, so LIDAR data is, is some of the best um, data that you can um, achieve as far as elevation data goes. Um, and, and it's very useful for surveying because it has such accuracy to it. All right. Um, what else should I say on this chapter? Um, there aren't really any good questions. I was thinking of maybe a, a small project uh, using this LIDAR data, but 
not sure. Surface derivatives. Oh, um, yeah. Oh, I just want to show you a few more things. Uh, so now that we have this this great elevation data, right, for um, various places around the there are many things you can do with um, with that data. Um, and, and if you go to data and um, look at some of the analysis parts of it, you can get like areas and volumes of things. Like if I wanted to look at um, this water tank, um, it's a little, because the points aren't that close together, right? If I measure that, I don't know. Do I have a measure tool? Yeah. Let's just measure, you know, from there to there. Yeah, that's almost a meter, right? So these points are, you know, several meters apart. Um, so you're not going to get this nice, perfect circle um, for the for the um, for the data, so I can't pull out this nice water tank out of this data. Um, it'll be pretty, pretty rough. Um, so the um, data that you can get here, though, is you can do some other. Um, you can get volume data out of it, and just realize it's not going to be perfect. Um, let's try a difference between surfaces. No, it has to have input surfaces, so we can't do that. Um, plane bounded by feature. So if I can put an input feature on this, I thought you could export. You could actually generate features from that. Maybe it's in here. So with that layer selected, these are the tools that are available for um, for use with this raster data set. Um, not really. It sees it as a raster rather than, so not all of these are actually useful. This raster to polygon might actually work if we classified it. Um, there may be more um, tools in the raster, um, in the LAS tool set. So let's just take a quick look at the toolbox here. So if I go to analysis and click on tools, um, not favorites, but these regular tools here, um, might be under data management tools and LAS data set. Hmm. It's not actually, how about 3D analyst tools? Extract LAS, filters, scores, and reprojects the collection of lighter data. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I can produce a hill shade, but that's pretty much what I have here. It's all already being shaded. Anyway, there are a lot of tools that can be used. Um, one of them, back to data here. Uh, you can do a visibility analysis um, out of it, a line of sight. So um, I have to have an input line feature for this. So um, you 
you can determine you know what's visible from one point to another um, skyline yeah and so from one point to another so if i was standing on the top of this water tank um, i could i could get a map of what i could see around me you know there's this hill behind me i have some other stuff in front of me so at whatever angle it is um, so um, i don't know if uh, yeah let's just go ahead and do it so i don't have the points yet but if i go to the catalog in my projects folder, right in this geo database here. I'm gonna right click and add a new feature class. Um, how about, um, let's call it view shed points. And they're gonna be point. Um, I will keep the Z values for this one. Next. Yeah, I'm going to pick the UTM zone coordinate system. Should be good. Okay, it didn't add it to my map, so I'm going to drag it into the map. And then I'm going to edit these points. I'm just going to add two points. So I'm going to create, create, and I'll put a point on the, um, I'm just going to do one point. There we go. Save. So uh, what I want to do with the data set here is um, do a skyline visibility, and I'm going to use view shed points as my, and the input surface is going to be this layer. And I'll do a 1,000 meter radius and virtual surface elevation, and that's how, basically, if I was five foot tall or something, I could put, you know, two meters or something as my height, but I'm just going to say right on top of, I'll just go two meters. And input features. Yeah, that's fine. I don't need it. Um, it could be this input features are used in determining the skyline. If no features are specified, then the skyline will consist solely of the horizon as defined by the surface itself. So I think we're good with that. <clears throat> we can constrain it to certain azimuths. Uh, we'll talk about azimuths uh, in more detail later, but basically that's just your horizontal angle. And uh, I'm going to leave those alone. Skyline options, maximum horizon. Nah. Um, yeah, let's go 5,000 meters. And let's just run it and see. Now let's change the coordinate system. It's going to produce a nice map here. So now it's taking that point and looking for, and it's just placing other points and calculating whether I can have a direct line of sight between those two points all over the map. So it's just building a, what, what is often called a view shed. Hopefully. <laughs> Um. 
Wow, is that is there nothing in that? I could have produced a blank layer. Yeah, I did. <laughs> um, maybe I didn't. I skipped over something. Well, that should have worked. <laughs> there may be a setting in there. But anyway, um, let's call that chapter five. And we'll not have a project in it. Just wanted to show you some of the stuff because really chapter six <clears throat> takes that information and, and starts using it. So most of the projects will be in chapter six anyway. So um, yeah, we let's see. And it does start with coordinate systems, which we've mentioned um, to start with. So I've introduced the, I'll just keep talking for just a few more minutes regarding the um, coordinate systems. As we've already seen in just making a few of these maps, even the chapter four map, we've needed to choose a coordinate system. And, and that allows the map to be flat, basically. It projects, it's a projection, okay? So in looking at the coordinate systems for, for the map itself, right, or the data, everything needs to be, um, needs to have some sort of reference, right? So um, if we think of like math class or whatever, we, we have X and Y coordinates, right? And that, that produces a flat plane, the X direction and the Y direction at 90 degrees to each other. We can locate anywhere on the earth based, based on that really. Um, however, because the earth is curved, we have to flatten it out somehow and that produces distortion. Okay, so no coordinate system covers the entire earth uh, accurately, um, but it can, it can be very accurate if you're just covering a small portion of the earth. And that's why um, the UTM has has 60 zones of accuracy, right? So if it gets too far outside of that six degree zone, then it starts getting unaccurate, right? It starts losing its accuracy. So, so that transverse Mercator is a cylindrical uh, uh, projection, meaning that um, if you can imagine the, the, um, the earth inside a, let's see, I had, let me stop sharing real quick. Okay, so if I have a piece of paper that, oh, this is not going to be good. Well, that's, it's invisible. Yeah, that's fun. Anyway, uh, let me turn off my background. Okay. So if I have a uh, piece of paper and I roll it up, then I can mimic the, or I can cover the earth a whole lot better, right? Than just if the earth was, if, if the paper was flat. So if I put this around the earth, you can imagine the earth inside this, um, I can stand up the uh, cylinder and I can wrap the, basically this piece of paper would be standing or it would be touching the earth at the equator, right? Um, let's keep the earth, let's keep the earth north-south oriented, like in the piece of paper, and then I'm gonna turn the paper. So I rotated the paper this way. And now the paper is touching the earth from pole to pole, right? And let's say it's touching, you know, I don't know which pole, which line of lat uh, longitude that that piece of paper is touching, but if I rotate the paper and take 60 different um, lines, right, if I rotate this around, keeping the earth stationary inside this as I rotate, I can take slices, basically 60 different slices, and that is what the universal transverse, meaning it's laying down, Mercator is the guy's name that did it. And, and so the, the line of longitude that the paper is touching is, is the center of that zone. And so six degree zones 
or three degrees on each side and, and um, copied as, as it rotates around. So each of those zones is, is um, very accurate for um, distance measuring uh, north to south and um, to a certain degree east to west. So that's a, pro a cylindrical projection that, um, that allows you to unfold the, the earth just unfold, you know, project it to that paper and then unfold the paper or unroll it into a flat surface. Another way to do that is uh, using a cone, right? So I can turn this off again. So if I have my piece of paper and instead of rolling it up like a cylinder, I roll it up like a cone, right? So I kind of pinch the ends, doesn't matter if it touches at the top. Now, if I have the earth inside this conical shape, even more drastic. So here's a conical shape. Then um, because this, this turns out to be a pretty good um, way to project the um, earth because if you put that over the earth at any angle you can put it anywhere you want and um, the the portion of the cone that lies against the earth if the earth is inside here um, is is very good for um, areas on the earth that are further away from the equator right because this cone if it was sitting right on top of the earth like a party hat would be um, not touching the equator, right? It'd be touching more northern latitudes. So you'll find countries in more northern areas um, having conic types of projections. And then all the way up at the northern North Pole and South Pole, you'll find orthographic projections where you're just projecting them straight to the to the surface of a flat piece of paper, just a straight projection, orthographic in other words. Okay, so I um, want to show you that just real quick, um, but well, we're out of time. So um, yeah, we'll um, we'll continue that on chapter six. So that's kind of a precursor to chapter six. So um, as far as the assignment goes, how about just read chapter six? Just go over that and chapter five for that matter, if you want. Um, be good sleeping material, I guess. Anyway, we'll talk about latitude and longitude a little bit more in chapter six. So we've already covered a lot of that stuff anyway, so we can get to some problems. But we'll talk more about coordinate systems specifically uh, Monday. We okay? Yeah. All right. Sounds good. So um, I'll try to get the video up soon enough. Um, maybe I'll just edit this one and um, take out the boring stuff. So was this uh, just like, just, were you just showing us how, how, how it's done? Up to the yeah, yeah. So you don't have to, yeah, you didn't have to actually do it or whatever, but I did, oh. I, I did just want to show you, yeah. If you're going too fast, I was like, whoa. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, well, we'll see you in a little bit in the other classroom. I'll make yeah. a call and make sure they open it, so. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you. Yeah.